Hello, everyone, and welcome to Thermo Fisher Scientific Webinar Series on Protein and Cell Analysis Education. Today, we present on high content screening based phenotypic analysis of organotypic 3D bronchial tissues, presented by Dr. Diego Marascotti, a high content screening manager of system toxicology at Philip Morris International R&D. I'm Susie Valdez, and I'll be your moderator for today's educational webinar, presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. You can submit them in the question box located on the left-hand side of the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing the presentation in a slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the top right. If you have any trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, click on the support tab located at the, up above the slide window or use that question box on the left and let us know you're having a problem. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Diego Marascotti. Dr. Marascotti is a high content screening manager in the systems toxicology department at Philip Morris International R&D. After completing his PhD in oncology and in molecular pharmacology at the University of Ferrara, he continued his research investigating the mechanism of tumor escape from immune surveillance. As a scientist, he joined Philip Morris International in 2012, bringing his knowledge and interest for flow, cytometry, and imaging. He is now leading a team of researchers which operate a high throughput system for compound profiling. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marascotti. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and please let me thank Thermo Scientific for giving me the opportunity to talk and describe the work that here at Philip Morris we are doing. So to set the context of today's topic, we need to refer to the three R principles, which were developed more than 50 years ago, and is based on the concept of replacement, reduction, and refinement of animal use in science. In scientific fields, such as toxicology, where harmful substances are tested for evaluating the potency of their effect, 3R implementation has, in the last 10 years, became a major objective. Several international agencies have developed a joint program known as 21st Century Toxicology, with the scope of developing more efficient and less time-consuming approaches to predict toxicity. In this context, at Philip Morris International, with a view to the scope of 21st century toxicology strategy, a system toxicology-based approach has been established as a part of the ongoing assessment of the reduced risk product, product with the potential to reduce individual risk and population harm in comparison to conventional cigarettes. System toxicology is a branch of science which resides at the intersection of system biology and toxicology. It integrates classic toxicological approach with computational network models and quantitative measurement of molecular and functional changes occurring across multiple levels of biological organization. It is therefore a multidisciplinary approach which combines principles of chemistry, computer science, mathematics, and physics with high content experimental data with the scope of characterizing and evaluating interaction between potential hazard and the components of a given biological system. Omic technologies, in combination with advanced high content screening method, represent the fundamental pillar of a system toxicology-based approach. This technology not only helps to understand mechanism of toxicity and disease processes, but they also facilitate application in line with the vision of the three R's. In fact, the strategy recommends the use of more physiological in vitro model, which in combination with computational models could accomplish the prediction of in vivo effect based on in vitro data. Here at Philip Morris International, we routinely use 2D submerged cell culture system together with a series of image-based endpoints, which individually or multiplex, are used to characterize toxicity profile of various compounds and product of interest. The table on the left shows a summary of view of endpoints that are included in our routine toxicity profiling. 
markers of oxidative stress, mitochondrial health, cell viability, and cell cycle-related markers are most commonly investigated, relying on the use of lung and cardiovascular in vitro models, such as normal human bronchial epithelial cells and human coronary aortic endothelial cells. The panel of image on the right shows examples of some of these endpoints. In particular, representative images of untreated and positive control treated, including phosphorylation of histone 2 ax translocation of nuclear factor Kb, and increase in cell membrane permeability, are shown. For many decades, standard submerged 2D culture represented the only available tool for scientists. The requirement for more physiologically relevant in vitro system closely mimicking the characteristic and functionality of the part of the human body they model, has led to development of more complex cellular models which range from 2D co-culture to 3D complex co-culture system. It is widely accepted and recognized that 3D cell culture system enable a more accurate and physiological representation of the in vivo environment allowing for intercellular interaction with more realistic biochemical and physiological responses. Today, 3D models are widely used for different applications and are also part of our in vitro model portfolio. However, the increasing complexity of this model has also introduced several new technical challenges, which I will introduce in the remaining part of the presentation. To further evolve our high content screening assay portfolio, and leverage the work performed in 2D model, we invested in the development of imaging-based approaches, <coughs> which would enable high-content investigation of 3D bronchial tissues. When grown to confluence on a transverse system and culture at the air-liquid interface, normal human bronchial epithelial cells form a polarized pseudostratified epithelium composed of basal, ciliated, and goblet cells. This culture system provides a useful tool for the in vitro study of airway epithelial biology, as it closer models the architecture and the microenvironment found in in vivo situations. When compared to submerged cells, the in vitro response of differentiated airway epithelial cells may more accurately model the lung response. As a proof of concept, we decided to investigate phenotypic markers which are known to characterize the 3D model of the human upper airway, in particular, Cell type specific markers such as beta tubulin, mucin 5AC, and P63 were selected to identify ciliated, goblet, and basal cells, respectively. In addition, the one, a member of the family of the tight junction protein, was also included. Imaging this 3D model meant we had to overcome some technical challenges arising from the intrinsic physical properties of the cellular model. First of all, with the intention to avoid any additional manipulation of the insert, which would have made the process more time-consuming and labor-intensive, the intact insert, including the transwell holder, had to be imaged. This has, of course, two direct implications. First, a longer distance between the cells and the camera objective. And second, the presence of a microporous membrane. Both factors may, in fact, interfere with the imaging process potentially leading to decreased and less sharp signal detection. In addition, 3D alley models are more complex. Cellular morphology is in fact no longer comparable to the 2D counterpart because of the added third dimension. As a consequence, we are looking at a much more pronounced cross-section of the model and also at an uneven spatial distribution of the nuclei. For high content screening-based method, the 2D cell culture, nuclear staining is normally used as a reference for focal plane and for cell identification. Unfortunately, this approach proved to be challenging when applied to more complex 3D culture. In fact, as just mentioned, the uneven spatial distribution of the nuclei is impacting both the image focus and also the identification of the individual nuclei. To overcome these technical issues, the standard image analysis workflow had to be reconsidered taking also into account that now the scientific investigation could be performed both at cellular and tissue level. Depending on the scientific question, single cell selection may also not be relevant in the context of the 3D culture, as it could be more interesting to perform the evaluation of the entire tissue structure. Furthermore, 
we notice that, unlike nuclei, the special distribution of the selected markers along the z-axis appear to be more consistent. Therefore, we decided to utilize the selected phenotypic markers to identify the optimal focal plane for their imaging. As just mentioned, the identification of a unique and consistent focal plane based on nuclear staining was challenging, and it often led to a failure, as the instrument was unable to identify the focal plane. To enable a more consistent and reliable detection, each of the selected phenotypic markers, which showed a more consistent spatial distribution along the z-axis, was used as a reference to identify the optimal focal plane for the imaging. Once this was determined, a specific offset was then applied to image the nuclear counterpart. As previously anticipated, since we were not interested in single cell identification, but rather in evaluating and characterizing the whole structure of the tissue, the nuclear staining was analyzed using the Spock detection method, a rapid and flexible image analysis algorithm that can be utilized to provide generic spot analysis applicable to a variety of eye content assay. Normally used for the identification and analysis of intracellular punctate objects, such as multiprotein complex specialized endosome or other organelles, it is in this case used for tissue component identification. This way, we could evaluate how big an area of the field of view was effectively covered by the tissue. It was in fact possible to identify those fields where the tissue is damaged or detached as well, as those where the camera reached the border of the insert by simply evaluating the total spot area at field of view level. The method robustness was evaluated by having the values of four entered field of view from four independent replicates. As shown by standard deviation, variation was as shown by the standard deviation, variation was minimal. Similar to detecting the, nu the nuclear signal, the expression <clears throat> of specific phenotypic markers was investigated by applying a spot detection based mask. In this example, on the image on the left, you can see the classical tight junction signal following ZO1 staining. This very much looks like an image obtained with normal bronchial epithelial cells grown at two confluence. This image also showed the typical cuboidal shape of the cells, which they acquire when differentiated at Ali. In the center and in the right image, we have example of stain, ciliated, and gobbled cells, respectively. It can be very well appreciated how homogeneously distributed the cell types are across the whole field. One of the advantages of eye content imaging, similar to other fluorescence-based methods, is the possibility to investigate several markers simultaneously. In this example, basal and gobbled cells are staining the same tissue. P53, the basal cell marker, is imaged in the green channel, while using 5AC, a marker of goblet cells, is imaged in the far red. Such a combination enables gathering biological insight while decreasing cost, as both markers can be investigated simultaneously in the same tissue. However, the approach is of course limited by reagents have ability. Fluorocom wave wavelength, and antibody species compatibility must be in fact considered when the staining protocol is designed. As previously mentioned, it was our intention to also evaluate the whole structure of the tissue. Besides the spot detection-based numerical quantification of the cellular feature, the single field of view images taken with both fluorescence and bright field microscope can also be mounted to enable whole tissue visualization. After accurate optimization of the form factor, it is possible to fully image the entire 3D tissue by taking 60 images with a 10x focus. The visualization of this image has proven to be very valuable in the evaluation of the whole tissue structure. In fact, structural damage and abnormalities can be easily spotted. However, for a higher throughput and time-saving application such as fine-tuned quantification of the marker of interest, it may be sufficient limiting the investigation to 16 or 32 field of view, as they would already represent 35 and 70% of the whole tissue area respectively. With the project described so far, eye content imaging can be used to evaluate more complex 3D in vitro model. For example, it can be exploited as a tool for fast and accurate quality control of the tissue, it is in fact possible within 24 hours to evaluate both the expression 
and the distribution of tissue maturation marker. In addition, the very same marker can also be used as experimental endpoint in experiments looking at specific phenotypic changes, such as goblet cell hyperplasia or the loss of barrier integrity. In the next couple of slides, I will now introduce you a few examples where this approach were used. With regard to the tissue quality control, we regularly perform evaluation of phenotypic marker expression and distribution once maturation is achieved. In the example reported in this slide, Expression of cilia is evaluated by imaging the whole tissue upon staining with anti-beta tubulin 4. It can be very well noted that the expression of the marker is not homogeneous. In fact, the tissue is characterized by a higher expression of the marker in the outer ring compared to the center. This was further confirmed once the image was analyzed with the spoke detection algorithm. Extrapolation of the data at field of view level enable a quantitative comparison between the outer ring and the center of the tissue. The next example is instead focused on an in vitro model of goblet cell hyperplasia, which was evaluated as a proof of concept. As TH type 2 cytokines, such as IL-13, were previously demonstrated to induce a goblet cell hyperplasia phenotype in the airway epithelium in vivo, we decided to evaluate if the same phenotype could be recreated in vitro. Using our 3D bronchial tissue, IL-13 was applied apically in a repeated fashion, and an evaluation of the phenotype was performed using the approach of staining goblet cells with mucin A5AC specific antibody, as described before. Using our development method, we demonstrated that IL-13 induced an almost fourfold increase in goblet cells density, as shown by the total area of the spot detection. In addition, looking at the average intensity, we also noted an increase of nearly 40% of MOOC5AC production at single cellular level. Altogether, these data showed that combining high content screening based application with more complex in vitro culture, which better resemble the in vivo physiology, represent a step forward in the process of in vitro method development, aimed to enable the replacement of the use of animal in research. An additional step aimed to increase the biological investigation at sample level is the combination of high content screening method together with traditional immunistochemistry. High content screening allows a planar characterization of the tissue by providing information with regard to the X and Y axes. These information are very valuable as they can describe the distribution of different cell types through the whole tissue, providing evidence of tissue organization. On the other hand, immunohistochemistry instead provides a longitudinal view of the 3D structure along the z-axis, and therefore are useful to visualize and investigate cell polarization and the development of the tissue in the third dimension. Combination of the two methods applied on the very same sample will provide a more comprehensive morphological characterization of the tissue architecture and will enable a more accurate analysis of maturation process. All imaging process and analysis performed in this presentation were performed with thermoscientific cell inside CX7, which compared to previous models such as RISCAN VTI has a superior flexibility in terms of focusing option and available wavelengths. The integrated confocal module has improved performance, shorter exposure time, more even images, and overall better confocal image quality. Color Brightfield LAD also offer more options for acquiring picture in the Brightfield spectrum. Overall, 6.7 proved to be more flexible and more robust than the modular RA scan. The presented work was developed and performed in the System Toxicology Cellular Laboratory of the Research and Development Center of Philip Morris International in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. A special, a special thank goes to all the contributors who have supported, helped developing, and performed the study. Thank you, Dr. Marascotti, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's begin and take a look at our audience questions. Dr. Marascotti, you show that the nuclei are not identified and selected as singular and independent objectives, but rather analyzed considering the area they cover. Could you better explain 
how then the object normally intended as single cells is defined in your process? Sure. Um, to be honest, object identification is actually not performed as classically done when working with 2D cellular model. In fact, the algorithm is set in a way that the entire field of view is, is identified as an object. And then, since cell count is not considered, we rather intend to evaluate the tissue integrity. If you put this into the context of pure toxicological assessment, and you wish to do the classical cell count and cell viability readout, you will find this approach extremely complicated. When toxicity is high, the tissue will detach, and no imaging will be uh, possible. In this case, the biological system has some limitation, as only subtoxic concentration should be tested to still ensure a reliable readout. Thank you. And I want to thank our audience for their live participation. This next question has two parts, Dr. Marascotti. The instrument used for the images acquisition is equipped with a confocal module. Did you test it in the context of this analysis? And if yes, what could be the advantages? In the presented work, we did not include any confocal image. Uh, however, we did have tested uh, and evaluated the use of the confocal module uh, with this tissue, but we found no particular benefit in the context of the presented approaches. Surely, it can be of help if different endpoints and analysis would be considered. I could, for example, imagine that investigation of nuclear factor translocation would definitely require such an approach by using confocal uh, microscopy. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question, considering the increased complexity of the 3D tissues when compared to standard 2D submerged cells, could you comment on how the staining procedure was adapted to the cellular module? Overall, the entire staining process do not really differ much from the 2D procedure. We simply adapted some of the steps, in particular antibody dilution and incubation. We still perform a pretty standard fixation incubation time of about 20 minutes, and then permeabilization as blocking is performed for about an hour, and primary antibody is incubated overnight to ensure that it can penetrate and reach also the, the bottom part of the, of the tissue. In case a secondary antibody is used, that is then added for an additional hour. Usually, the staining procedure is performed only at the apical site, in order to use only little amount of the reagent, about 100 microliter in total, that is the volume that we regularly spike on top of the, of the, of the tissue. However, depending on the thickness that the tissue sometimes develop, it might be sometimes necessary to perform additional staining from the basolateral side. Thank you. And I want to remind audience members that any questions not answered today will be answered via email. Dr. Marascotti, I want to give you some time to just provide any closing remarks for our audience members. I want to thank again Thermo Fisher Scientific for the opportunity for showing uh, the work that here at Philip Morris has been done in the past few months and here. It's an ongoing process and I really hope to get uh, another opportunity uh, later to, um, to show follow-ups of the, of the ongoing uh, eye content screening activity and the development of new cellular model that we are enrolling for in vitro assessment. And thank you again, sir, for your informative presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.